Barry, I, I think people know who you are here. Uh, you came as the chief conservationist for the Nature Conservancy. Actually, I lived on the shore before I ever went to work for the Nature Conservancy. Great, because I was going to ask you, because I don't know your backstory. Could you sort of talk Same about Same as yours, your Norfolk. Well, could you tell us? Well, I was born and raised in Norfolk. Uh, first came to the Eastern Shore. I guess I was 14, 15 years old. I was taking a summer school course in marine biology that some of the, I guess, top students got to take. And uh, um, we came to the VIMS lab and went out to Paramore and Cedar. That was probably, geez, I don't know how long ago that was, 50-some <laughs> years ago. And then uh, when I was in college, one of my roommates, my senior year, was some painter, a guy named uh, Sean Webb. And my wife, who was then my girlfriend, and I moved over here in May of 1972 with the idea, I had graduated from ODU with a degree of biology, but Dixon was president, the federal government wasn't hiring, and the chances of getting the job were pretty remote So uh, at that point, so we decided to move to the Eastern Shore for the summer of 1972 and never left. That's what it comes down to. And then went to work for the Nature Conservancy in 1976. Yeah, so we were here roughly uh, saying my history here goes back to the early 50s. Well, your dad was a big deal in Norfolk, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Um, I remember the name. But he got started here as an architect working for my grandfather, and he had a number of jobs on the Eastern Shore. And in those days of the ferry, um, yeah. is it was just easier to set them up over here. And so we lived here in the uh, 50s while I was here for all those jobs. I grew up on the creek where the ferry docked over there at Little Creek. Well, we were not far <laughs> from you. Yeah. And I remember moving over here, I mean, Kellum, she was some relation to Sean. She gave us a, a trip up and down Nazawatics Creek. And I looked and I said, geez, this is just like... Little Creek, except it doesn't have a naval amphibious base at the mouth of the creek. <laughs> this was pretty nice. You know, it still had ospreys. I can remember when the ospreys on Little Creek disappeared uh, when I was a kid. So, uh, uh, like I said, moved over for the summer and never left. So can you tell me a little bit about, you know, how you hooked up with the Nature Conservancy and about uh, the work that you did with them? Well, I met, uh, I met a fella, they did a study in 75 and 76, uh, the Virginia Coast Reserve study, where they looked at the, what they had bought on the islands and the state and federal laws that affected their ownership and did title searches. And they did a big uh, uh, eco ecological description of the plants and the animals, the birds, and and what was important out there. And that, uh, at that point in time, the Nature Conservancy was doing a lot of large landscape scale projects, but they were turning it over to the federal government to manage. And they decided as a result of this study to uh, retain ownership of the islands here since it was only four hours from DC and uh, sort of develop it as a model of what they could do in their thinking and all. So uh, uh, I met a fellow working on that study and uh, got to know a few of them. Uh, I knew they were going to hire somebody. I, uh, I applied for the job and, <laughs> and got it, basically. So can you uh, say more about the work that you were doing? Well, uh, uh, I started out, I was like, a, uh, I basically was the eyes and ears on the eye. They hired me because I had a science degree and I knew how to run a boat. They, they didn't have much boat experience. So. Uh, matter of fact, the first director here used to say if he was ever going to manage another preserve, he was going to make sure you could drive to it. <laughs> but uh, um, so I started out, I'm hell, I was a game warden. First, first day I went to Hog Island, I found two duck traps. Uh, um, you know, and there was, the, the islands at that point were still sort of a no man's land. We had squatters on Cobbs Island, we had dune buggies riding up and down several islands. Uh, we still had people egging back then and, and all. And uh, uh, my job was sort of to get a, a read and a handle on that. And then the Conservancy uh, adopted a landscape scale to, 
to uh, approach the conservation. And uh, um, I got involved with the, the planning for that, basically, uh, uh, where we were going to envision the islands as sort of the cur core preserve, and then the mainland and all around it is the, the buffer area. And uh, um, through that landscape scale approach, I got interested in what happened on these islands in past years. Um, I found out about the, all these bird collectors who went to Cobbs Island back in the 18, late 1800s. Uh, I've got 70 some of them documented, I think, at this point. But, uh, um, and I started doing some research at the, the local library, and one Monday evening I met Miles there. <laughs> and Miles asked me what I was doing, and I told him, and I showed him some of the, the stuff I had, and uh, we basically agreed upon first meeting to collaborate on this book, Seashore Chronicles. He, he already had, uh, um, had a rough outline of it. Uh, and uh, over the next couple of years, we worked on that. We met at the library every Monday night. Uh, they had a copy machine, and we got all the old Forest and Stream magazines on microfish from all these different places, and went through every one of those pulling stuff relating to the Barrier Islands, and also the Chesapeake Bay, and I also collected a lot of North Carolina stuff, but uh, uh, I've got files upon files of stuff back at the, my house. Miles has it all, too, so it will probably end up in the the new library and the heritage room or whatever they're calling that. It's important that that work uh, endure. Um, I've read, uh, actually before Seashore Chronicles, almost all of what's yeah. in Seashore Chronicles, because at the same time I was sitting down in a dark room with the microfilm reader and going through and reading all these things. And I mean, it, those histories are really quite magical yeah. often. Yeah. yeah, some really neat stuff uh, in there. Uh, uh, I've been toying with the idea about uh, just pulling out all the hunting ones and doing sort of a, you know, the old sporting life on the Barrier Islands, but uh, I just, you know, never had the time to get around to it. But uh, I'm still, every once in a while, working on the, the bird collectors because these islands play, you know, everybody knows about Guy Bradley, the Audubon wa warden that got killed by the plume hunters down in the Keys. Well, these islands, all these, the, all the big wigs of the ornithological world basically came to Cobbs Island in the 1800s because they had a place to stay and they had reliable transportation to get out there. Three or four of them came on their honeymoons and uh, they all wrote about what they saw. And it all kind of rolled into the... Uh, bird protection movement, which evolved into being the conservation movement. So these, what happened on these islands in the, in the late 1800s played a major role in the, in the public's uh, appreciation of conservation or growing appreciation of conservation. And well, a lot of people don't know that. One of my favorite parts in all of those accounts um, are the ways in which those um, bird collectors and others describe the residents in, as rustics. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they went to great pains. The same great pains to describe the people as they did to describe the birds that they encountered. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know the deal about Charles Sterling and Alexander Hunter and the, the accounts they wrote about Hog Island, which are, you know, a lot basically word for word. Nobody knows who wrote the original one, but one of them talks about how great the people on Hog Island were, and one of them kind of puts down the people on Hog Island. So, yeah, they were mixed, and there were photographers out there. Or, you know, oh, yeah. Rudolf Eichmeyer's photos of Hog Island are really pretty astonishing. Yeah, when I found those at the Smithsonian, it kind of blew me away. Uh, which I, uh, uh, you know, we had an office up there. I got one of the secretaries in our office uh, uh, to go there and, and, you know, she just sent me like 50 of them she got the first day and it was, it was amazing to look at them. Yeah, and uh, what's interesting is Eichmeyer actually sent a number of them back 
the photographs to the members of the community. Yeah, he sent them back or left them here with him. I'm not sure what, but uh, yeah, George Dowdy shorebird hunting on Hog Island, uh, the Conservancy had that. They he, they got it from Ted Ward, who had the photography shop in Exmoor at one point. But uh, uh, I noticed the new Cobb Island book says that he's probably on Cobb Island, but if you look at the photos, you can see him you know, walking across the island with, well, you see him in a cart first going across the island. You see him walking by the 1852 lighthouse with the gun on his shoulder. And then you see him on the beach shorebird hunting. So, uh, 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 but anyway, yeah. Yeah, those are um, quite wonderful. You know, um, they're platinum prints. And um, yeah. they, um, I think that they were printed and then brought back or sent back. Yeah. Uh, but Buck Dowdy still has uh, a few of these. Does that he really? Come down through his family. Yeah. Uh, and he's very, um, very careful and very generous with uh, with uh, sharing them. They're uh, really something to see. Yeah, I talked him into giving it, uh, George's shotgun to you all. <laughs> when I found out he had that, he didn't. He wasn't sure or whatever. And I kind of, uh, you know. Uh, stress that it needed to go to a place like this and I guess you all have it here now yeah well I don't know but I would I would yeah. hope so I do remember Kellum Dowdy I'm sure you remember Kellum I only met him one time I, I did live on his old farm down below Eastville uh, for six or seven years but uh, and they the, it was down in what they call Mooreville where the Moors live and they spoke highly of Kellum but uh, I only met him briefly for one time uh, he was uh, he was quite wonderful. He was you know he was deputy for a while. Yeah. Uh, but when he passed, he his deathbed was uh, Grover Cleveland's bed yeah. from um, the islands. And, yeah. Um, but then it was all sold at a yard sale, so oh. nobody knows where any of it went. Yeah. So I was curious. I have the one question here. I mean, I have a lot of questions about uh, your experience with the islands and going yeah. on out there but one of the stories i've always wanted to hear were the livestock roundups yeah this, the, the that had to have been an adventure out there yeah uh sort of yeah well you know when we bought the well we first bought the north end of hog island and then we bought the broadwater land and improvement company property on the south end and you know they were cattle and sheep running around out there, and uh, Harvey Bowen at that point, uh, who was an old hog islander, he kind of claimed ownership. You know, he introduced Brahma bulls into the cattle herd and, uh, and all, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, we talked to him for years, I'll never forget it, about the, you know, we need to get the livestock off the island. Oh, I can't do it, but, you know. So we ended up trading him a 10-year oyster lease for his rights in the cattle and sheep. As soon as he signed off on that down at the lawyer's office in Eastfield, he looked at us and said, if you need any help getting those cattle and sheep off of there, let me know. I've got all the men and equipment to do it. <laughs> After years of claiming he couldn't do it. Uh, so the first roundup we did was the sheep. And he built, uh, Harvey built a big V corral down by the wharf on the south end. And we waited till, uh, uh, the livestock on the island, depending on which direction the wind blew, went to one end or the other to get away from the mosquitoes and all. And the sheep were like in horrible shape. I mean, you, you know, you'd see where it looked like somebody drug a rug down the beach. They had so much wool on them. And then when you saw one, they had branches and limbs and trees and everything else stuck in the wool because nobody was taking care of them. They didn't even look like sheep in some cases. but. Uh, so we built a big v, v corral and basically herded the sheep into it. For some reason, they liked to stay in a herd. They were all down on the south end. And then we loaded them on a oyster monitor. Uh, it was about a little, I think it was a little over 100 of them. A few of them jumped overboard and swam back to the island. And we brought the biggest part of the sheep ashore to Harvey's farm on uh, Matchpunga River. And uh, we gave <coughs> half of them to... Virginia Tech, and Harvey kept half of them. And the ones that are on the shore now were part of the ones that Harvey spread around. Uh, the ones that went to Virginia Tech, they thought they, you know, had some immunity to parasites and all of that, but they 
quickly realized when they put them in a pasture in Blacksburg, they got all the parasites that the parasites just couldn't live on the island is what it was. And uh, so those sheep now are at Mount Vernon and Williamsburg and kind of all over the place, uh, uh, which is good, but they're not on the island anymore. We went, uh, a friend of mine and I went out there. There were still four sheep out there, two, two uh, uh, rams and what do you call a female sheep? But you. Two ewes. And uh, we went out there and shot the two rams. And uh, uh, that left two ewes out there, and they couldn't reproduce. And over time, they slowly uh, disappeared. Well, they're an unusual sheep. Yeah. Um, they only grow to about half the size of a regular market sheep, or you know, that you would grow yeah. for lamb or for mutton. Um, and they're thirst tolerant. Huh. They um, because the only water out there is essentially dew and rainfall. Yeah. Uh, well, there can be a lot of fresh water out there at times. There can be none at other times. So it, it's highly variable. But, uh, yeah. Uh, well, you've seen in, in our book, we have uh, Custis' account where he had this concept of increasing the commerce of the United States by spreading his sheep from Smith Island up and down the, uh, the uh, coast. But uh, all the islands, you know, I mean, I talk about it in the in the talk I give on the history. It's not so much in the in the book, but the, you know, the tobacco markets in London collapsed in the 1650s, and all the planters over here turned to, to cattle for beef and hide production, basically. And uh, uh, within a few years, from like 1670 to 1710, all the islands were patented and granted out by the crown and used as pastures because you didn't have to build a fence. So they were cattle, sheep, hogs, ponies, horses, you name it. Uh, yeah, most folks don't realize that all the islands were heavily populated with livestock of various oh, yeah. types. Yeah. And then with the cows, uh, um, you know, we had, uh, I guess it was about 70 still out there, including this big black bull who, uh, uh, a lot of people know the story about Grafton Bow, and he... Uh, he was out, he was the caretaker at the Brick Coast Guard Station at the North End back then. And uh, uh, just before the Conservancy bought it from the group of people from West Virginia that owned it. And uh, he walked across the island one day with his Labrador and crested a dune and walked up on the big black bull and his harem of females. And the bull charged him and gored him. He claims his lab grabbed the bull by its nose and that's the only thing that saved him. And then he had, with a you know, hole in his side and a couple of broken ribs, had to walk back to his boat, call on the CB to Willis Wharf and get him to get an ambulance to the dock and then drive his boat back to the dock. And this all made the news and all. And uh, um, you know, within a couple of days, three or four lawyers had contacted him about suing the Nature Conservancy. And, uh, but he liked the Nature Conservancy. I mean, he was, he was my primary source for a lot of the old stuff that uh, I learned about out there. They called him Goose. I don't know if you ever met him. He was a kind of short uh, guy. But, uh, so anyway, we started thinking then it's a good idea to get rid of the cows. And the only person I knew that had anything to do with cows was Phil Custis in Mazawatix. And I ran into him at the post office one day and said, you know, you want to give us a hand getting the cows off of Hog Island? He said, I'll get back with you. <laughs> and uh, uh, he rounded up this group of cowboys from Siler City, North Carolina, who they had, uh, they were ex-rodeo riders and foresters, and, but they spent their weekends catching wild feral cows for the owners. And uh, uh, they had, there had been a train wreck somewhere in Virginia and all these cows got loose and they rounded them up and it, it made the newspaper and people started calling them all the time to come catch the wild cows. And uh, Phil learned about them and called them and uh, uh, brought them up here. We, we first went out there in Thanksgiving in a driving three day Northeaster. And they got about half the cows. But the last day, they saw the big bull and all the females down on the south end of the island. And it was such a miserable time, we figured we'd never get them back. Well, they went back to North Carolina, and that's all they thought about was coming back to catch the rest of the cows. 
So in Easter, they came back. Uh, we got a small grant from National Geographic Explorer Series. They sent a film crew down here to film the cow roundup. Uh, the, the funny thing is uh, uh, the then director, we sort of divvied up the, the, uh, the work involved on the conservancy's behalf. I took care of the cowboys and the, cow, you know, the island, getting them out to the islands and all that. And since he was a photographer, he took care of the, the National Geographic photographer. Well, the first morning, the cowboys got up at noon, went down to the south end of the island, caught all the cows. <laughs> you know, 11 o'clock, John Hall was his name. He gets out there with the, the film crew, and they're all caught. <laughs> and uh, we had to turn them loose, so they, <laughs> some loose, so they could catch them and get it on film. And they had this thing about volunteers walking through the thickets, beating on pan, pots and pans to chase the cows out of the thicket and all this, which was all planned, but completely unnecessary. But it's all in this, this film. So is so, the film ever made and released? Yeah, it was shown on TV. I might even have a copy of it at home. But uh, I don't know if I have a format to show it anymore. A lot of that old stuff was like VHS or whatever they call it. But uh, 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 yeah, I might even have a copy of it at home. But yeah, it was shown on the uh, Explorer series on, uh, I guess, public TV. So the big black uh, bull, I assume, was not cooperative? Well. At that point, the big black bull was dead. Harvey, uh, there's a, uh, in the middle of the island on the back side, there's the cattle pens, which is where they used to round up and keep the cows to take them off the island. And uh, um, Harvey turned that into a big drop door trap, put some sweet feed in the refrigerator, and you know had it rigged where if the cow stuck its head down into the uh, uh, refrigerator, it tripped the door and the, the corral door would close and they'd be caught. So the first night he said it, we went back out the next day, he had the big black bull and three cows. And it was easy to get the cows into the, there was a little sub corral. The big black bull was having nothing of it. And I'll never forget it, Harvey was like 86 years old then. He got in the pen with this big black bull with a rotten piece of two by four in his hand. And the bull charged him, and he threw that little piece of two by four at the bull, and it dropped its head and hit it, but it gave Harvey enough time to get to the corral fence and get over top of it. I mean, the bull could have, it was all rotten driftwood. The bull could have gone right through the, but it reared up and stopped right at the, at the wall. And a couple days later, it, you know, it was, it was, I'll never forget it, it was massive. Looked like a buffalo or something. Its chest area was massive, and its haunches were like, like, you know, little. <laughs> uh, and it died in the corral, basically. So its its time was up. It just gave up the ghost. Yeah. All right. So you get all these cattle, or somebody gets all these cattle, and there are not many boats that navigate in and out of there all the way up that can carry a herd. So were they using like monitors? Or yeah, uh, uh, Buzz Terry's monitor. We built a, a, a fence around the edge of the monitor and loaded them on that. And uh, um, some of them went easily on the monitor. Some of them uh, took a little prodding, but I'll never forget one of them. Uh, E.B. Harris was the head cowboy. He uh, he, uh, he, he grabbed this cow that was real ornery and literally bit down on its ear and directed him up the ramp into the, <laughs> into the, onto the monitor. I'd never seen that before. They had prods, you know, electric prods, but he bit on the cow's ear. I mean, I don't know if he was showing off or, or what, but it, it worked. <laughs> he got the cow on the... But uh, we loaded them up, and the deal was with the cowboys was they got the cows. And uh, uh, they mostly, I think they completely went to a stockyard and were sold at an auction, probably. Well, they were lean, I am sure, having lived out there. Well, you know, cattle and sheep in Europe are uh, prized, you know, that are pastured on salt marsh are prized for their flavor. Uh, I ate some cow from out there. It was fine. You know, I've eaten Hog Island mutton before, yeah. and it's, 
you know, it's that French, uh, was it from uh, Mont Saint Michel, those salt marshes? Yeah. You know, it's what, Agneau Precel, um, you know, the pre salted mutton. Yeah. Uh, and it's lovely. Yeah. In fact, when I had it, was at a Guatemalan family barbecue. <laughs> <Gone>. <laughs> Only on the Eastern Shore. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, no, I haven't, I've never had any of the mutton. I did, uh, uh, a couple of us went out there just to, you know, we had people all the time asking us if they could go out there and shoot one. And so we went out there and tried it one day. Uh, shot a big bull in the sand dunes and field dressed them in the four quarters. Then I had to take a cart out there to get each quarter back to the boat. And then uh, uh, one of the fellows had a big walk-in freezer up in Parksley and we took it up there and basically made hamburger out of most of it. But uh, yeah, it was pretty lean, but it was good. So uh, you spent a good deal of time on these islands. Well, 38 years I was out there for the Conservancy, uh, uh, plus a couple of years before that, even just going out there to fish and, and recreate. I love the islands. I love wild beaches. Uh, you know, put me on a beach in the, a storm in the wintertime, and I, I really love it. And just the idea that these islands were going to remain in a natural state, uh, you know, my grandchildren would be able to go out there and see a wild island is, you know, it means the world to me. So what's your best memory or some of your best memories of the islands? Oh, geez, I, you know, there's so many of them and my memory is going, but, uh, um, you know, we, uh, uh, we allowed the first, uh, field trial of a genetically en engineered wildlife vaccine on Paramore Island with uh, the Wistar Institute uh, and a uh, drug company from, uh, from uh, France, uh, which was kind of interesting. Uh, uh, you know, at that point, rabies was killing about 50,000 people a year around the world, and uh, they developed this vaccine using uh, vaccinia virus as the carrier basically and uh, they needed a biosecure place to field trial it and they had uh, they talked to us the game commission told them about paramore and all the foxes and raccoons out there which interested them and uh, they also looked at uh, I forget what island it was in South Carolina uh, island in South Carolina and then Harrogate and Hugo came through and destroyed the South Carolina <laughs> island basically and uh, so it put all the pressure on doing it here on, uh, on one of our islands. And uh, there was a little bit of controversy. It was, a, you know, it wasn't a live vaccine, but, uh, you know, some people got the misconception that we were introducing this, you know, rabies and all of that. And that wasn't, that wasn't it at all. But uh, uh, so they did the field trial. They put uh, 3,000 baits out and within 72 hours, Literally every bait had been taken up by a raccoon or a fox or an, a ghost crab or a seagull in a couple of cases. But, uh, uh, and they developed the antibiotics and so it was successful. And the next year they put them out on the mainland up in Pennsylvania. And now they're using that vaccine all around the world, which, you know, to the conservancy was a legitimate use, you know, of our property. Uh, even though our business was preserving nature uh, it was uh, something to help mankind, basically. So you said earlier on, I want to come back to this, you know, that when you first went out there, is that on your first day you discovered two duck traps yeah. when you're out there. You know, my experience in the, the marshes is you're never as alone as you think you might be out there. Um, and so you must have run into people over time. Um, and I was wondering, um, I've heard of folks who've run into everything from SEAL teams to their next door neighbor. Yeah, I've, uh, I've run into hovercrafts and SEAL teams. Uh, uh, I guess the last one was the SEAL team on, the, on Wreck Island, which was kind of funny in a way. But uh, uh, the guy with me was kind of scared because he, he was ex-Coast Guard. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, the state owned Wreck Island, and I was kind of was a, a volunteer to keep an eye on it uh, since I was going by it all the time. And uh, was out there one afternoon and looked over, and here's three inflatable boats with outboards right off the south end of the island with one boat on the beach and 
six or eight guys walking around putting up an antenna right in the middle of a bird colony. So, so I walked over, the, or we rode over there in a the boat, and I leaned out of the boat, and I said, can somebody tell me what's in charge here? And nobody said a word. I mean, these guys were sitting in a boat with the camouflage paint on their face and the whole nine yards. And then I, I said, well, let me change that. Who the F you is in charge here. And everybody turned and looked at this lieutenant sitting in the front of the boat. And we both go ashore and get into this conversation. He's trying to tell me he's on Fisherman's Island. I'm trying to tell him he's on Wreck Island. Uh, he finally <laughs> gets kind of... You've just explained why so many things go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, uh, he tried to... Uh, well, he got kind of frustrated with me, and after a while, he basically looked me in the, straight in the face and said, you know, you need to mind your own business. And, I mean, he was like 29 years old or so, and, I, and you know, I was much older than him, but I wasn't afraid of him. I got right back in his face, and I said, you don't understand. My business is protecting these birds in this bird colony. <laughs> You're disturbing. And... Uh, you know, that's, this is my job, basically. And he didn't have any comment after that. But uh, apparently they had motor problems and they were trying to call over the little creek for some reason. But uh, uh, I told Heritage, you know, the state all about it. And the next day they called Little Creek and no, oh, there was no SEAL team over here. Same with the Hovercrafts. You know, I caught them several times and called Oceana, which was in charge of uh, uh, the Navy ones anyway. And, oh, and, you know, there's none flying over here is what they call it. And uh, finally I was flying one day and took a picture of one from the airplane up on the island and emailed it to the guy over at Oceana. Said, oh, you got me. <laughs> and, uh, but it was funny, there were some from the, uh, Fort Story and some from Little Creek. And uh, if you found you know, an Army one, the Army would say it was the Navy. If you found a Navy one, the Navy would say it was the Army. And uh, so it was kind of confusing. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, so they haven't been out there years, but I remember the first one I ever saw going through Sand Shoal Channel. It was uh, uh, on the other side of the marsh, and all I could see was this uh, white van, <laughs> which was on the deck. <laughs> it looked like it was driving across the marsh from a half mile away, but uh, uh, anyway. Uh, so yeah, SEAL teams, I mean, I ran a lot of people, uh, uh, not a lot, but a handful of people uh, hunting where they shouldn't be hunting, you know, like we didn't allow any hunting of the jackrabbits on Cobb's Island and caught a few people doing that. I don't know. I guess they did it for sport because uh, we caught one local guy who's now deceased, but he had the biggest jackrabbit I've ever seen. We took it from him and uh, we couldn't eat it. We crockpotted it for hours and even the dogs wouldn't eat it. It was that tough. But uh, uh, I don't know what else. I mean, uh, you know, there was some uh, drug smuggling going on out there in the, the late 70s. I where, remember all the bales that yeah, washed up. Yeah, well, there was a lot of inner tubes, too, uh, with uh, Lebanese hash in it uh, uh, at that point. But, uh, um, yeah, uh, I mean, it was like a half a ton at one point. Well, Archie Bradford found, uh, I think it was 1,200 pounds on the... On the uh, Hog Island washed out of a dune. Apparently they anchored offshore and the, the DEA and all were following them at that point, but uh, then they they anchored off Hog Island for five days, and this was what the Coast Guard told me later, and unloaded it on Hog, and then went into Norfolk and got boarded over in the mouth of the Elizabeth River, and uh, they were clean. So they came over in a landing craft, the Navy, uh, DEA, and I don't know who else, and they found like 40 kilos. Uh, and then after that, I don't know how long it was, I, I carried a landscape architect class from UVA out to Hog Island. We landed at the wharf. There was no other boat there, and we're walking across. And I look over at the old Coast Guard station, which was still standing, and I see this guy up in the, the window. So uh, uh, I sent the class on across the island, and I went back to find out what was going on. And, uh, uh, this guy comes out, he's got, you know, hair longer than mine and a big beard and, and all of that. And I, and I asked him what's going on and he was kind of reluctant to tell me anything. And he turned around and I noticed he had a pistol and a holster in the middle of his back. 
And I said, oh, there's something going down here. I need to back out of here. And then I hear somebody yelling my name. And I look up in the upstairs window, there's Scotty Scott, the chief at Paramore, you know, calling out. And they all come down, and it was DEA and Customs and the, and the Coast Guard, and they were on stakeout to see who came to, to uh, they maybe promised not to tell anybody on the Eastern Shore mainland that they were out there. But uh, uh, so, I mean, there was that going on. Um, uh, I don't know what else. Uh, uh, uh. Well, what's your favorite thing about the islands? I mean, the islands are so wonderful, um, as are many of the, uh, the creeks on the bay side uh, as well. Um, but when you're out there, I'm trying to figure out the best way to ask this. I think is that when you're out there, what is it that fills you with wonder? The natural world, the biodiversity, the ecosystems, how it all interplays. Uh, uh, you know, that's not going on in my backyard, but it's going on out there. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it kind of all of it. Different seasons, uh, like I said earlier, wild beaches. Uh, uh, that all kind of turns me on. Yeah, they're extraordinarily um, uh, uh, beautiful. I wanted to ask you uh, a, a couple of other things, if um, if I might. Um, one is, and this is going to be a left field question, left in a sense, field. is that I've become very interested in terrapins. Yeah. Um, yet I've only ever seen one in the wild from the distance. But you know, the history of terrapins and terrapin fishing. Is a, is a big thing out there. And I was wondering if you ever encountered terrapins on the islands. <laughs> You're kidding. You've only ever seen one. You, you go out to Hog Island at full moon in May, and you can see dozens of them. We had a, a, a student from UVA when we set up the LTER. One of the first studies out there was on the terrapins. Uh, uh, I remember the first terrapin nest I ever found was on the interior dune on the Hog Island, and it, uh, I don't know if a coon had got it or what, but all the eggshells were lying on the surface of the sand. It looked like a bunch of ping pong balls lying there. But the, I can show you photographs where there's, you know, 20 or 30 on a marsh bank sunning themselves. They're really, really common out there. Yeah. Uh, but there was a time when they were almost exhausted. I don't know about out here. I mean, they, they farmed them and caught a lot up at Shinkatig, and the crab potters, if they'd catch one, they'd get $5 a piece for them back then. They would, uh, they would keep them. But uh, uh, by the time I got here in the 70s, there wasn't much of a market for them. And uh, uh, I, I do remember, I still have it at home somewhere, a recipe from Maryland uh, on how to cook terrapin. <laughs> you know, they, supposedly in the old days, they fed them to their slaves and and all of that, and then they became this delicacy. Uh, um, but uh, they're pretty common out there, Bernie. I, you need to go, uh, uh, I mean, just about any island in, in full moon in May, they come out of the ocean and go up on the beach and, and nest. Uh, um, pretty common for you only seeing one. <laughs> I just haven't been there at the right time. No. Well, you haven't, but full moon of May. Uh, I mean, they're along the edge of the mainland, too. I, I live down near Box Tree, and we see one or two every, uh, every spring digging in the, uh, next to the road trying to make a nest where they've come up out of the marsh. Yeah. Box Tree used to be a real landing place. There's not much there anymore, is there? No. When I first went there in the late 70s, I think there was 21 guys that worked on the water out of there. And... There's nobody, well, there's one guy left over at Webb's Island now, is it. But uh, I, they mostly were clammers. And, you know, clam aquaculture is uh, sort of taken over the clam market. And, uh, uh, and they don't catch big clams off uh, out here anymore. You know, the big chowder clams, they are pretty rare. And I don't know if it's disease or, or what... Uh, what has gotten them? Uh, some people, some of the old watermen claim it was, uh, you know, the watermen and uh, what do they call it when they uh, they have the post in the boat, the washing, the, you know, clams with their outboard motors, uh, tore them up. But uh, 
I can tell you a story. I won't tell you who it was because he's still alive. Uh, we went out of Oyster one day. Uh, it was a Sunday morning, and I saw this old waterman. I know he had a 20-foot wooden scow, and he, he had a five-horsepower gasoline pump in the bow of his boat. And I thought, well, he's pumping in pylons or something, you know. And we went out fishing. We came back in about six hours later. And here he comes with like 2,000 clams in his 20-foot scow. He'd gone out and hosed down a mud flat and walked around and picked up all the clams. He needed some money in a hurry, basically. But uh, uh, that fellow's still alive, so I can't say his name. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I can guess who this might be. Yeah. Um, but I, too, will say no names. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that was a big change is when people started doing that because before it was really all about signing, treading, or raking. Oh, yeah, yeah. Picking up clams, a nickel apiece. I, it's a hard way to make a living. My back would give out after a short uh, while of raking clams. And uh, signing was easy, but they don't always sign. No. I but always like treading. Yeah. That yeah. was the easiest. Yeah. I never did much treading, but uh, they sure did that out of box tree. I remember seeing them. There's a big sand flat out there by Gull Marsh they called the uh, uh, home farm. And there'd be 10 guys, 15 guys out there with their inner tube in the basket and their little canvas boots and walking around picking up clams. Yeah, you but, can uh, really feel, you can tell a live one from a box, from a dead one, uh, anything. I mean, you get, you get pretty good at that. Well, you know, if you look at his, historical stuff, uh, all the watermen used to be called clammers, even though they did oysters and scallops and all of that, and most of the laws and, and a lot of the accounts, they're all called clammers because that was the major way of making a living. And then they started catching the surf clams out in the ocean, and that kind of ended all of that. I mean, that was the in market. the 70s that that really took off. Yeah. And, uh, so how have the islands changed over the course of your uh, engagement with them? Uh, over the course of my engagement, for I would say in 40 years, for the first 25 years or so, they changed, but it wasn't uh, a huge change. Um, you know, there were things like uh, the first time I went to uh, to North Smith Island, uh, the locals had built a like a 50-foot dock on the backside of the island where they could get up on the beach without getting their feet wet and walking through mud. And I went back out a couple of years later, and that dock was a line of pylons out to surf. And I went, well. And then I met and read Orrin Pilkey's book, The Beaches Are Moving, and it all started coming together to me that uh, you know, the islands have moved on the order of 50 miles in the last 15,000, 20,000 years, which is extraordinary when you think about it. And they're still migrating up the continental shelf and all. But the last 15, 10 or 15 years, the, change has been pretty dynamic. Uh, you know, we lost the south end of, of Cedar Island, the north end of Cobbs Island, the north end of Wreck Island, uh, uh, the beaches, you know, Paramore Island, the beach accreted from the 1800s to like 1980. That's why there was that series of dune ridges you went across when you walked out to the beach. And now it's roaring back to the west, right into the the, the trees and all. Uh, Cobbs Island is in two pieces now with an inlet cut through it. Myrtle Island has merged with Mink Island, and Mink Island is now the oceanfront uh, island. So uh, uh, some pretty, pretty big changes in the last 10 or 15 years. Now, whether that's due to climate change and accelerated sea level rise, that's the only thing that, that makes sense to me, that that's what's going on. Um, but, you know, if you look at time over how the islands have migrated, it never was all in one direction. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, goes back and forth across the landscape. But uh, uh, so lately, a lot of change, big change. So they could roll back to the, uh, they could roll east as easily as west. They could push out. If sea level starts dropping, they would roll east. Uh, you know, there's a, the Mapsburg Escarpment along the edge of the mainland. That was the edge of the coast like a hundred some thousand years ago and built out 
to the edge of the continental shelf, and now it's coming back. Uh, you know, the Norfolk Canyon is the ancestral mouth of the Susquehanna River, basically. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, where the river was between the channel and the bay and the canyon now is all filled up with sand. But uh, um, so, I mean, that's why they dredge up mastodon tusk and woolly mammoth and, and I don't know what else uh, uh, on the coastal plain offshore, the surf clam boats. That was high ground not that long ago in the geological time frame. So, yeah, I was talking to Danny Dowdy at one point, and he talked about his father actually in the marshes finding, um, I don't know what he was doing, but he finding mastodon remains actually in the marshes. Yeah, I was on Cedar Island last year, and the girl found a tooth that was with us. But uh, I've got walrus uh, tusk and uh, elk antlers uh, that I found out there. So it was a different landscape back then. Very different, and um, different know, for got, plants, too. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard about the, uh, the Paleo Indian site on Mockhorn Island? I was going to ask you about Mockhorn Island. Yeah. I haven't heard about this, so I'd like to hear about it. Well, back uh, 15,000 years ago when sea level was hundreds of feet lower, um, you had two river valleys, the, the mockhorn Bogotha River Valley and then another one on the east side of Mockhorn Island, and they call it an inner fluvial uh, landscape. It was basically a ridge between these two estuaries. And uh, uh, up towards the north end of the island, of Mockhorn Island, they uh, found the uh, paleo, well, actually it's two sites. There's one on the west side, one on the east side. And the really interesting thing is they found some Clovis points and all of that, but the, the majority of what they found out there were stone tools that were used for woodworking. And they think it was the site where they built canoes, basically. And, uh, you know, so uh, that's probably the oldest historical site on the Eastern Shore at this point. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize that um, that there were river valleys that were on the east side of the mainland here that came down and did things like bisect Mockhorn and well, yeah. well, it went on both sides of it. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, there's an old map from the 1700s that, you know, where main ship shoal channel is, with mm -hmm. deep water channel just sort of goes up into the marsh and just kind of disappears. Well, back in those days, it went on down to Smith Island Inlet. You know, it's all filled in now. But uh, uh, so, I mean, not only the islands are changing, the bays are changing. I mean, uh, uh, a lot of uh, the marsh behind Smith Island used to be Smith Island Bay. I mean, there's... There's eelgrass sanctuaries in the middle of salt marshes out there from, I mean, just, you know, a hundred, less than a hundred years ago where it was open water. Uh, so, uh, uh, and you all, you know the story about the, the eelgrass and all that. In, was it 1929 or so? Uh, 29 or 30, uh, uh, it completely disappeared. It was a, a pandemic that stretched from Europe over to New England down to North Carolina and, uh, it disappeared uh, uh, up and down the Atlantic coast, except in areas where it was, uh, it was growing in low salinity. It was a high salinity uh, event or whatever, and uh, uh, it never came back, came back everywhere else up and down the coast, but never came back to our base. And a uh, uh, fellow at VIMS, Bob Orth, uh, uh, I saw a presentation he gave in the late 90s on the uh, he developed this method of harvesting the seeds in the spring and curing them over the summer and planting them in the fall. In this program, he showed the, the slide. This was in the York River because he hadn't started over here, but it basically, you could see the track of the boat over the bottom where they went out, drove along throwing the seeds overboard. And I said, man, this guy's got something here. And went up, talked to him, and... Uh, and agreed to help them, uh, you know, got the conservancy involved. We basically provided the community volunteers and set up a, 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 a facility in Oyster Harbor to cure the seeds and all of that and, and helped him over the years. And uh, uh, I think we've uh, planted like 400 acres now and have almost 10,000 acres growing. It's spreading on its own now, which is good. 
Uh, which one? It'll it'll harden the bottom, which is yeah, it hardens soft. the bottom. It you know collects sediments, it dampers wave, uh, and it's uh, it's food for brant, and uh, uh, it just provides habitat for uh, you know a lot of fish and all of that. We do these uh, trawls, and it's amazing the amount of uh, you think you you know you're trawling over what was bare bottom ten years earlier, and there's all kinds of little fish and urchins and stingrays and crabs and and all of that stuff. And now and scallops. We're, now we're working on the scallops. Uh, Unfortunately, it seems like most of them are recruiting the clam netting instead of eelgrass, because <laughs> that's where uh, they're finding a lot of them. But uh, we have, do- you know, Bob has documented some reproduction out there, so it's it, it's going to be a little different critter than restoring the eelgrass. But uh, uh, you know, and at one point, the late '90s, oysters were pretty much extinct on the seaside. Uh, I mean, when you flew over the marsh and saw a waterman mudlarking through the marsh to get oysters to sell because all the rocks are dead. That lets you know how bad it was or whatever. But uh, uh, I was lucky to get uh, a stimulus grant of like $3 million for uh, TNC and VIMS and, uh, and all and, uh, and VMRC. And uh, we built uh, 50 some acres of oyster reef and planted more eelgrass and started on the scallops with that grant. So. Uh, um, it's, it's, you know, it feels good to, I mean, I'm really proud of my participation in that because it feels good to participate in a project like that that actually is successful. You know, everybody does a project like that, declares success and walks off mm-hmm. and nobody knows what happens to it in the long run. But uh, that's been highly successful. Uh, um, so, yeah, I know the feeling on a micro scale is that uh, we hold seven acres of lease ground in um, our creek. Yeah. And when I first started 15 years ago, there were maybe 300 oysters, wild oysters there. And, you know, just using common sense and standing in the water. You learn more by standing in the water through a tide <laughs> than you do by reading, I have to say. Yeah. And uh, I've now been able to restore uh, five oyster rocks um, yeah. and all the stuff that comes uh, with it. It's it's important work. So let me ask you this part of uh, the question. Um, part of your job was about a lot more than eco- ecological questions. You were also a diplomat out there, uh, an emissary, because the Nature Conservancy was a foreign entity. And you had to do a lot of diplomacy. Yeah, it was kind of disappointing to me when, uh, you know, I had moved over here and met all kinds of local people that, uh, you know, were real friendly to me and and all of that. And then three years later, I go to work for the Nature Conservancy and literally half of them disowned me overnight. (laughs) How in the hell can you go to work for those bastards and and all of that? And... uh, I kept saying, well, you know, I mean, some of them, a good friend of mine, you know, they all thought the economic salvation of the shore would lay in developing these islands. And, you know, the conservancy was the bird lobby and, you know, going to protect, keep, kick people off the islands and all this kind of stuff. When, you know, and people back then, local people in a rural area, they rather believe their neighbors and their uncle than what we could tell them or whatever. And, uh. There were some bad feelings caused by uh, the Matomkin Island uh, acquisition where uh, uh, we had bought most of the islands at that point and uh, 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 George Walter Mapp owned Matomkin Island and he didn't want to sell it to us because he wanted to see it saved for development. So the Conservancy created a dummy development corporation and, uh, and bought the island from them and turned it over to the Conservancy the, the next day basically. And, uh, uh, you know, that made the news on Christmas Day in like 1979 or, or so. And, uh, uh, you know, I kept telling people that, that bitched at me about it. I said, you know, people sell their farms all the time to some lawyers and, you know, somebody from Arabia or Syria or somewhere else, you know, ends up owning it. That's, it's just a common practice or whatever. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I... Uh, 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 I used to say, you know, what the Conservancy needed to do was load a lot of these people on a Trailways bus and take them to Atlantic City, New Jersey, and say, is 
is this what you really want on your barrier islands? I mean, just look at this. You're, you're less than a block from the ocean, and you're standing on artificial turf and concrete and don't even know the ocean is there because uh, the buildings are blocking the view and all. But uh, we never did do that, of course. Or but, you could take folks out to uh, Cedar Island yeah. and show them what happened yeah. uh, trying to build out there. Yeah. Well, that's. can you imagine if, you know, the Smith Island, Kings Beach, the resort on Smith Island, if it had gone through or whatever, what, and all the islands, uh, I mean, we'd have a combination of condominiums and, and all where local people wouldn't be allowed out there, the tar paper shacks, which was <coughs> one of the favorite forms of development on, uh, on Cedar Island. But uh, yeah, Cedar Island, I, re I can remember I met Ben Benson out there at one point on the north end of the island, the guy who was selling the lots for uh, him and his wife. And uh, uh, he had built this like quarter million dollar Victorian, you know, gingerbread trim house on the north end. And he sold off a bunch of lots and a bunch of other houses built. And uh, he, he, he told us, he said that, uh, you know, if he had to move the house within 10 years, he had the wherewithal to do it. 11 months later, he had to move the house, <laughs> not 10 years. And then <coughs> a year or so after that, he had to move the house all the way down, buy land on the south end and move it all the way down to the south end. And eventually it was moved to the mainland. So, uh, uh, you know, there, there was no economic, I mean, you know, the county doesn't have to pay anything to protect the islands and keep the beaches from moving. And, and all like they have to do everywhere else. Or in North the coast. Carolina, building a road that they have to move after every storm. Yeah, uh, it's crazy. I mean, uh, you know, personally, I think we need to put the same effort in pulling back from the coast as we did in developing the coast over the last 50, 75 years. Of course, that are, that'll never happen, but uh, that's what it's gonna take. I don't know what's gonna happen in the long run. I mean, Norfolk, Miami, uh, it's going to cost billions and billions of dollars. Well, uh, Norfolk's well on its way to becoming the next Venice. Yeah. Well, Miami, you know, it's on uh, it's sitting on limestone, porous limestone. They they already have water flowing up out of the ground and flooding. You know, uh, it's amazing. So, uh, well, I was interested in the diplomacy part because yeah. I mean, you have to interact, and it's been a long, long. Uh, conversation here, yeah, and but it's I don't, one I don't where know. you've prevailed. I don't know how diplomatic I was. I, I remember one time I, uh, uh, we had some people that lived up on um, Matompkin Bay that could see Matompkin Island. They called me at 8 o'clock one night and said, oh, the fire just got lit and there's three tents on Matompkin Island. So uh, Alex and I rode out there the next morning and, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was, I don't know, six, eight local people, you know, maybe six people. And the boat tied to one of our signs <laughs> saying no dogs, no camping, no campfires. They had dogs, they had a fire, they had a tent set up. So I walked over and uh, I said, you guys, I, you know, you're something else. You, you got all three strikes against you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I always told them that, uh, you know, this, I was going to refer this all back to Conservancy and they had to decide what they do. And, you know, we never prosecuted anybody. But... Uh, uh, for trespassing or anything, uh, but uh, it's same with the. Uh, I did trust. We did prosecute one group of oystermen who uh, we had an oyster sanctuary down at Smith Island. They had their boat tied up to the sanctuary sign <laughs> saying no oyster and while they're working on it. And we had uh, wildlife services out there doing uh, predator control, and they thought it was our boat. And they went back there when they realized what was going on. They took some pictures, and uh, you know. We took them to court. They couldn't argue that, you know, they didn't know what they were doing was wrong. But uh, uh, so a little bit of that. But I don't know how diplomatic I was. I'm pretty big and gruff. Right? People claim that I am anyway. But uh, uh, so it's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear that people consider me a diplomat. <laughs> Well, I was trying to figure out a way to diplomatically ask the question about yeah. being a diplomat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I didn't have a. Whole, I don't have a whole lot of patience, I guess you'd say. But uh, uh, particularly when somebody knows better, mm -hmm. but uh, decide to do it anyway. So I was gonna. 
ask you is, because we've been talking uh, for a while, what's it? What do you wish I would ask you? you know, what have I not asked? Well, I, you know, what have you not asked? I don't know. You've, we've covered a lot. I can't really, nothing's really coming in my mind here, uh, which might be a product of <laughs> my health and all. <laughs> but uh, I don't remember much anymore. I, somebody said, when are you going to do your memoirs? And I said, man, I, I've forgotten it all. <laughs> no way could I write it down. But uh, uh, I, you know, I tell a lot of people uh, this is the best job in the world, uh, uh, or it was. I'm retired now, but uh, you know, where else can you live on a on a farm or farmette on the, on the eastern shore along an undeveloped stretch of coastline and have the best part of the Chesapeake Bay five miles to the west? Uh, uh, for somebody who grew up on the bay, I mean, this is it's paradise. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Oh, I have to agree. There right. is a, something for me, grabs there's you. no place more magical. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Something grabs you about living here. Uh, uh, but, uh, and, you know, I used to tell people, too, uh, <coughs> the seaside was comparable to Yellowstone. You know, instead of, instead of wolves, we had piping plovers. And instead of, you know, elk and all, we've got oyster catchers or something else. I mean, it's. It's just a different ecosystem, but it's just as important. Um, and, and I'm pretty proud of the fact that the islands are still pretty much undeveloped. It's the only undeveloped stretch of coastline left on the Atlantic coast. It's, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of what we did was uh, develop it as a natural laboratory. We always had research going on out there, and then we formed the... Uh, long-term ecological research project with EVA and the National Science Foundation and the amount of research just exploded. I mean, the whole theme of that program is to look at the change that's going on out here. If, you know, if you're an ecologist working in the mountains, you're lucky if you see a change in your lifetime, but out here you see a change when the tide goes in and out. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great natural laboratory. and. Uh, and the one thing I told the Conservancy when I retired, I said, well, one of the things you need to do is get this preserve more integrated into the local community. And I think what they're doing now with this environmental education and all uh, will go a long way towards uh, meeting that goal. Uh, okay. In closing, I'd like to, you know, early on you talked about, you know, children and grandchildren and their children yeah. and all these things. And how, if you were to close your eyes and describe a walk across Hog Island or Cobb Island from being on the marsh side to the Atlantic side, could you just sort of walk us through that experience? Well, you're walking through uh, a lot of islands. You have to walk through some marsh, just squishy and muddy and has an aroma of, of sulfites and all that, uh, uh, and a lot of life. I mean, periwinkles and fiddler crabs and all of that. And you, then you hit the backside where you start getting a little relief. Uh, uh, a lot of cases, it's an old dune line or whatever. Then you walk in the thickets, start cursing the mosquitoes, which will pick you up and carry you away. Uh, you know, I went to the Arctic twice and in the early 2000s thinking I was finally going to go to a place where the mosquitoes were worse than these islands. No. The mosquitoes up there were big and slow flying and the wind was always blowing so your biggest problem up there was walking downwind. You had to keep your mouth shut or you'd inhale mosquitoes that were hanging, you know, behind your body to get out of the wind. But uh, uh, the bug life out there is, is pretty bad, you know, mosquitoes, ticks chiggers, uh, biting flies of several varieties or whatever. And you walk up and down, you go through the dune and the dune grass and uh, uh, you break out on the open beach, the sandy beach, and you look up and down for miles and there's nobody else out there. Uh, you see a lot of birds uh, on the way and uh, then you look at the waves breaking on the beach and the ocean and uh, 
It's uh, it's it's a nice trip. Uh, I don't, you know, most people don't walk across. You know, most local, no local people walk across the island in the summertime. I should say that uh, they always stay to the beach, which is pretty wise. But uh, if you plan your trip on which way the wind's blowing, you don't want to go to the beach when the wind's blowing southwest because the flies are all hanging on the, you know, downwind side of the sand dunes. They're right there waiting for you to lay down on the beach and. The, so you want to go when the wind's blowing east and, and all that. The cattle and the sheep on Hog Island had it right. You know, if the wind's blowing from the south, you walk down to the south end of the island <laughs> and get away from them. So, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a treat. Uh, uh, you know, some of it, uh, like, you know, Paramore Island, we had the, the big tall pine trees and the Italian Ridge, the, you know, 20 some foot, uh, sand dune in the middle of the island, which was pretty extraordinary, but, uh, um, you know, there's shipwrecks along the beach, peaches of shipwrecks, fossils, all kinds of, uh, I mean, tremendous number of shells, just not a whole lot of diversity of shells, but uh, a lot of oysters and clams and uh, scallop shells up and down, which is another, is more evidence of how the islands have moved. I mean, those oysters and clams and scallops grew in an estuary that used to be offshore of the islands, you know, when the islands were further offshore, and now it's, it's watching up on the beach. Uh, you know, one day I can remember being on Ship Shoal Island, which used to be a, a bombing range after World War II for the Air Force over at, at Langley, but uh, it had rolled back, and uh, you could see this, where this creek had been in the marsh, and in the middle of that was an oyster rock about half the size of this room, with oysters the size of your hand sticking up by the hundreds. They were all dead, you know, because they'd been buried under the island for probably a hundred or more years. But uh, that sort of gave me a clue of, you know, what, uh, what this place used to look like before the Europeans uh, got here. I mean, it just was, you know, a sight to see. Uh, yeah, such a rarity. And so, back then, I didn't have a camera phone, you know, the, so no pictures. But I still remember that day. So out of curiosity, I was out on Paramore this last year, and um, I wondered why all the shells were black. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, I mean, what I've been told by geologists and all of that, the black shells have been buried in mud for a long period of time. I mean, even Indian artifacts that are buried in marsh sediment change colors, which I never, never realized until I read about that last year. So uh, uh, I think it just indicates that it's been buried for a while in, in a muddy substrate and before it was exposed. So these are really old shells that are that are washing up. Yeah, I don't. Well, some of the some of the white ones are probably just as old. They just weren't buried the same way or whatever. But. Uh, um, just the number of scallop shells out there lets you know but, uh, how many scallops used to be out there. But uh, uh, Matompkin Island has a lot of shells on it, and it's primarily due to what geologists call the Shingatig River Valley. It used to be a, a tributary of Susquehanna that went across the Delmarva Peninsula and then turned and ran south down to about where Watch Creek Inlet is before it turned and went off the continental shelf. Course. It's all filled in with sand now as the coast migrated back. That drowned estuary, uh, everything in it washed out. And that's why there's so many shells on, uh, on Matompkin compared to like Hog Island or even Paramore Island. So we were once an island. The, sh the eastern shore of Virginia, if the... Well, this part of the shore didn't exist when that was there. So I'm not so sure we were an island. Uh, of course, we're an sure. island now with the De Delaware Canal, but uh, I don't think that counts either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we're an island by attitude. Yeah, yeah maybe so. Maybe so. But, uh, uh, but you know, I mean, Hog Island, with people abandoning the island and moving off, uh, they did the sensible thing. There was no government bailouts back then, no beach nourishment projects. They did what they had to do. and. Uh, of course, nowadays when that's going on, they're all demanding, you know, sand, uh, beach nourishment, and and walls, and and that's the worst thing you can do as far as nature's concerned. But uh, uh, 
uh, yeah, they did the sensible thing. I used to, I, I, mean, I used to use that as an example all the time to, to people. Uh, uh, what's, you know, we need to be doing that elsewhere along the coast. There's not enough money to, to pay to do it everywhere. But uh, uh, people, are, I mean, people build their half million dollar house looking at, you know, everybody wants to look at the ocean. In the old days, people lived on the backsides of islands. They didn't want to live on the ocean. We kind of changed all that starting in the 50s, I guess. Uh, so, and any development on the island generally ends up costing more in taxes than it generates. So it's not, uh, it's not an economic boom or whatever, but yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time <laughs> to do this today. No problem. <laughs>